So Brian Brown is the Integrated Weed Management Specialist with New York State Integrated Pest Management. He works with growers, extension educators, industry leaders, and researchers to address knowledge, address knowledge gaps in weed IPM and develop programming to improve adoption of effective weed management practices. His work covers all agricultural crops and community settings throughout New York. So you can tell he's busy. It's all yours, Brian. Great, thank you, Betsy. And uh, thanks to the organizers for hosting such a great and uh, smoothly running event. And uh, thanks to you all for, for showing up and, um, and with all your interesting questions. Um, and do keep those questions coming. And I, I, I don't have the um, chat screen open, Betsy, so just feel free to interrupt uh, whenever new questions come in. I can do that. Great. So, um, so I'm going to talk about uh, biocontrol for weeds. And it's going to be kind of like three parts today. Um, I'll give a very brief overview of some landscape level biocontrol for weeds, um, uh, some efforts run by the federal and state governments to release various, usually insects, to control certain weeds. Uh, then I'll get into a little bit of um, possibilities, or some, some things for you to think about in terms of incorporating livestock or, or weeder geese and things of that nature. Uh, in your gardens or, or, or small farms. Um, and then what I'm really excited about is going to be the last third where I'll talk about um, uh, ways you can enhance habitat and improve populations of uh, various organisms that eat weed seeds to um, limit your weed seed bank and the number of weeds that emerge every year. Okay, um, so Let's see, first off, can anyone uh, answer, and does anyone recognize this plant here, this invasive weed species? It, it, and if you can, uh, if you could pop it into the chat so I can see uh, if anyone is aware of, of this plant, that would be great. Oh yeah, purple loosestripe, they're coming in fast and furious. Okay, great, yeah. Yeah, so this, um, you know, if, if you, drove along Interstate 90, uh, you know, maybe 10 years ago, um, you get to the, the spot a little bit east of Geneva where there's the giant uh, bald eagle sculpture. Um, that's the Montezuma Wildlife Refuge. And, and it used to be covered in, in purple loosestrife like this, um, which, was, which was problematic because it was outcompeting other species and, and not as good of a, um, uh, of a species for for all the birds that that would stop over and uh, and on their migratory treks. Um, so uh, purple loosestrife, uh, luckily for us, is actually one of the uh, the key success stories of uh, biocontrol for weeds. There were I think four different species of of beetles that were released by state and and uh, federal government. Um, that either feed on the leaves, defoliating purple loosestrife, or, or feed on the roots um, and kind of compromise its, uh, in, its structural integrity and its ability to uptake water. Um, so, and, and you still see purple loosestrife here and there, but it's not nearly as, as widespread as it was uh, in large part due to these biocontrol efforts. So this, this field guide uh, that I pictured here on the, on the right, um, actually maybe I can, yeah, there's the chat, okay. I'm gonna pop in two links there. Okay, great, thank you, I was just gonna do that. Um, yeah, and so the top one is for the field guide, the other link I'll get to at the end. Um, and this is an excellent resource, I think it came out in 2016. Um, it's it's still uh, fairly um, current and uh, and pertinent. It it has it documents all the efforts of of universities, of state and federal governments, and their um, in their work on um, on on research and on actual releases and results using various biocontrol agents. And I've just kind of summarized a few of them here on the left. 
Uh, purple loosestrife I talked about. Mile a minute is is a, a, a kind of a, a competitive and aggressively spreading vining weed that used to be uh, much more common, but has I don't see it as much anymore. And I think that's due to uh, some successful releases um, mm -hmm. of biocontrol. Scentless chamomile is actually a very pretty flower in the aster family, um, but uh, considered an invasive weed. Um, and I've, I've color coded uh, the, the biocontrol agents that, that um, the field guide outlines, and, and they use the same kind of color coding system with, with green being um, species that they have successfully um, uh, introduced into areas and that, that are effective. Uh, yellow or orange being species that maybe aren't quite as effective or, or they're, they're still in the research phase um, or they're worried about them maybe spreading over to other host plants. Uh, and then red uh, being those that either just aren't that effective or they, or they hop on over and they, they uh, predate on other species, making them a, a poor candidate for, for biocontrol releases. Uh, rose that, girls would agree with you on that for rose rosette. It it affects too many of our garden roses. Yeah, yeah. So that's the case for for multiflora rose. Um, and then, unfortunately, for Japanese knotweed and for uh, Canada thistle, they're in that kind of in between the yellow phase. Or we we may have something that that may work, um, but it it kind of has limited effectiveness uh, or scope. So. Um, that's that's my brief overview, and I, I guess for more information on that, uh, check out this this great guide uh, that I linked to. So I just uh, to make a point in there, Brian. Too one of the other things about that is many of those are not available to homeowners to release absolutely. because you have to have yeah. licenses to bring them in. So yeah. it's interesting to know what's being done and to kind of keep track in your own area to see if something that was very common seems to be less so. Um, but they're often not available to homeowners to release. Yeah, good point. I, I meant to make make that point that um, yeah, these 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 are 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 efforts typically done by by state and federal government on a large scale, um, and you know it's it's not something that you're going to be buying and, and releasing in your backyard um, for a few different reasons. Uh, one of them being that it, it it may not be as effective as as some other techniques and, and typically not very cost effective, but on a large scale, uh, it can be can be effective. So, um, but yeah, if, if you've got a, a big backyard <laughs> or a small farm, um, you may you may consider livestock. And here I've, I've put together a table based on some um, some work from the University of Georgia that kind of outlines the preferred diets of a few different farm animals. And yeah, I, I guess a, a lot of our, uh, you know, or, or some of our weeds may be grasses or, or legumes like clovers, um, but I'd say probably most of our weeds fall into this other category on the, on the right here. And um, you can see that cows and horses don't really eat many of, of the species. They don't prefer many species in this other category. Whereas sheep will eat 10 to 20% of their diet from this other category that includes a lot of our weeds. Uh, and goats will eat 40 to 50% of their diet. So I, I think that, um, you know, as as weeding biocontrols, uh, probably goats would would make the best um, bet here. And as far as land requirements, you know, one cow would would require about two acres uh, if you're if you're going to be supplying most of its its forage um, from from what it eats off the ground. Um, sheep would require about half an acre, and goats a little less than that. So um, again, I think goats and sheep are, are probably the two most um, applicable or uh, feasible for biocontrols. And in fact, there's, there's some companies now that have herds of goats that will, um, can be hired to, uh, to defoliate 
and and control weeds in in areas that uh, may be too too tricky to mow or uh, if if you've got plants like poison ivy that uh, you don't want to be sending people in there to to pull out the goats will happily eat poison ivy and and that's the the picture on the top right uh, on the left side of the fence is is uh, a large patch of poison ivy and on the right they've they've controlled it and nipped it right down to the buds. Uh, these are both um, perennial weeds, poison ivy and Japanese knotweed, so they would require um, consistent or, or repeated control efforts, but but simply as a means of of removing all the foliation, um, goats would goats do this very effectively. On the bottom is a before and after picture with Japanese knotweed. Uh, and you can see them happily uh, munching away there. Um, sheep are, are also being used on, on a commercial level uh, to control vegetation at the bases of um, photovoltaic uh, of farms, solar farms. And um, I think sheep are the better uh, option here than goats because goats are, <laughs> as you may know, are, are, are climbers. And I think they would be hopping up onto those solar panels and, and uh, probably breaking them with their hooves. Um, and uh, the top is a, a photo from uh, Justine Vandenhuvel, who's uh, a professor at Cornell who's looking at using sheep in grape vineyards, uh, per particularly for wine production. Um, since there's less of a, a, a human health safety concern from the feces uh, with wine production, the grapes are, are going through a, more of a sterilization and, and fermentation. Um, but they're very effective at controlling uh, all, the, all the vegetation on the ground, or at least most of it. Um, and, and we'll actually prune off some of the lower, they call them the sucker, uh, branches on the grapes as well that would normally require an extra uh, management step to come through and prune those off. Uh, weed or geese can also be effective um, and kind of uh, a more accessible or, or easier um, uh, entry point in, in that they're, they're less expensive than, than goats or sheep. Um, and they're smaller so it could could perhaps be used in a smaller garden. The downside with with geese is that they really they really only eat grasses and maybe a few broadleaf weeds, but um, their their preference is 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 uh, definitely primarily grasses. So they would need to be trained. And uh, I've I've read accounts where where farm owners have have actually trained the geese to eat uh, broadleaf weeds, but um, uh, just as as they come out of out of the box uh, in your orders, they're not going to be eating many broadleaf weeds. So that's a downside with geese. Um, pigs, on the other hand, um, do a lot of uh, of tilling and and controlling and and kind of turning up of the soil with their hooves and with their their snout, um, and they're great at finding yellow nut sedge tubers. Yellow nut sedge, I've I've pictured on the left here, is a grass-like weed. It's it's in the sedge family, um, so as these kind of sharp edges, um, and it's a perennial weed. And it, it's it perennates. It it lives through the winter via these um, these small little tubers that are about the size of your fingernail or smaller, um, and pigs are are great at finding them, sniffing them out, and eating them. And this this one. Uh, account I found said that about 30 pigs consumed just about all the yellow nut sedge tubers on one acre in one day. So very effective. Um, and if, if you really had a problem with, with yellow nut sedge, and it's a huge problem, especially on Long Island, um, that you might consider bringing in some pigs. And um, th there's a few different ways that, that you could uh, bring in animals like pigs or, or chickens, um, but one of the ways to kind of keep them contained um, you know, and keep their foot traffic, and especially with the chickens that kind of scratch and peck, and then you know, the, the pigs with all their hoof action and they're kind of digging, 
uh, it can be helpful to keep them in a, in a contained or relatively small area and move that area every day or every few days um, as, as you attain the, the level of weed control that you're looking for. And they call that a chicken tractor or, or a pig tractor. Um, and electric fencing can be really useful in that regard as well. I've um, worked and volunteered on a couple of farms that integrated livestock with their, their apples and with their vegetable production. And they used electric fencing, which you can really easily uh, move around. You know, it's lightweight. You can just, you know, stick a, a stake in the ground to mark off where the the new fencing lines will go um, and then turn the electricity on and then you know the fence is active and so if if you can kind of mark off uh, in between your rows or um, you know in some cases you know for for fruit trees you might just put a small fence a circular fence around each tree um, you know there's a lot of area in between your rows or in between your your tree plantings that the, um, the livestock can graze down and, and mow down for you. Um, some of the downsides with, with livestock um, are that um, you know, some of these plants so, uh, are, are, some of the weeds are, are toxic if eaten in high enough quantities. Um, so you wanna make sure that they're not overgrazing to the extent that it forces them to eat plants that they don't want to eat. Uh, there's other zoning considerations. I, I um, looked up a, a few different places, uh, uh, Ithaca, Rochester, and, and Albany, which I didn't mark, but it was similar to Rochester in that, yeah, you can, you're allowed to have some, some, uh, some chickens or, or fowl, um, and even a cow in Rochester. Um, but you know, there's issues. You know, neighbors may dislike the smell or the noise. Um, you've got to really watch out for um, them contaminating food with their feces. Uh, and it, it takes a lot of work to care for these animals. So that brings me to the final point here uh, about biocontrols for weed seeds. And just as kind of a primer on weed seeds and weed seed banks, the number of seeds that are in the soil, these are uh, soil samples from different farms that I've collected and brought back to the greenhouse and watered to encourage germination. You can see that the number of weeds that emerge, the number based on the number of seeds in the soil, really differs based on uh, the farm management. And the, the two farms on the right with nearly bare soil with very few weeds coming up have these, these practices that really try to prevent weeds from going to seed. So there's, there's very few seeds in their soil. Um, but, you know, sometimes despite our best efforts, weeds can get away from us. And, you know, we all have at some point have probably found ourselves in a weedy mess like this. And all of these, these weeds here have seed heads and are producing thousands of seeds that are gonna rain down to the surface of the soil. But uh, all is not lost, it's not too late. Um, seed predators like these carabid beetles or ground beetles on the left or mice uh, and, and others can consume 20 to 90% of these seeds that are sitting on the soil surface, uh, depending on the conditions as I'll, as I'll get into. Um, you know, the seeds as they're pictured here in the, in the top left, they really need to be sitting on top of the ground for the seed predators to find them. And so the type of tillage, if you've got a garden, whether you're rototilling or not, can really make a difference um, to, to really encourage these, these seed predators and, and have the, the soil, um, have the seeds resting on the soil. Um, you really should be considering no-till as uh, shown in the graph here. And just to skip ahead in the interest of time, um, again, no-till was really the best for seed predators in this other study. And this is some of my work um, showing that, again, uh, a no-till, a, a situation where you have a lot of dense vegetation, a lot of habitat is better than kind of bare soil or even mulched ground um, for, the, for these ground beetles. 
Um, so yeah, I think probably the, the encouraging habitat for ground beetles and seed predators is, is the most uh, important thing you can do for your garden as far as encouraging uh, weed, weed seed biocontrol. Uh, if there's time, I, I know I went over, the, uh, I can stop for a question. You've got some time. Also, John made John Lewis made the, the comment that they, their research project at Cornell, where they're looking at rotational sheep grazing, um, I think in with solar, is that they didn't, it is not incompatible with beneficial insects. So you can have them all. You can have it both. Oh, great. Yeah, yeah. that's a good comment. 